very much for bearing with me. <laughs> um, so uh, this talk is functional programming. Uh, it's Ruby, and I tried not to let too much other syntax leak in, although I realized looking over it, I'm not at all consistent with my uh, kind of Ruby. So uh, if anything's super weird, you know, I hope you can still, still get the gist of it. Um, so this talk is in five easy parts. Uh, some of the parts are bigger than others, so it's five very lumpy parts. Uh, part one uh, is the background. <clears throat> so our story begins a while back. Uh, so in fact, in 1936. Because 1936 was when Turing and Alonzo Church both put out papers within a short period of time of one another that uh, essentially introduced kind of the underpinnings of what we know as modern computation. Uh, and for me, if this seems like a bit of a tangent for a functional programming talk, it's that because I usually find it easiest to understand something when I first sort of understand the history of something. And so the history of this, I think, is pretty interesting. Um, so it starts even farther back, about 1900, where the mathematician David Hilbert uh, had a list of problems for the 20th century, many of which are still unsolved. Uh, and where this really gets interesting for us is this clunky German word, the, I don't know, does anyone know how to pronounce this? I, I say, like, uh, Entscheidungsproblem. And what that is in German is the decision problem. And the idea here is, can you give me a statement in first order logic uh, or I, rather, can you give me a procedure to decide if a statement of first order logic is true or false? And uh, in trying to solve this problem, both Alonzo Church and Alan Turing came at it from different directions, but they both got to the same place. Uh, and that's kind of, and the two different tacks that they took are essentially the split in computation that we have even to the modern day. So. The answer, of course, is, uh, is no, but that's a whole other very long talk. Um, so if you're wondering what first order logic is, it's statements that are kind of like this. For all x, there's, uh, for, it's true for everyone that if you program Ruby, then you're also a programmer. And uh, there exists at least someone who hacks on Ruby and hacks on Haskell. So there are these kind of. Uh, the upside down A is for all, and the backwards E is there exists, or there's at least one. So the question is the Entscheidung's problem, and uh, Alan Turing's answer is probably the better known of the two. Uh, his is essentially that if you imagine this little made up machine that he thought of, uh, you can compute with it. Uh, it will just draw symbols on a tape, kind of go back and forth, erase, add, change. And he worked out that you can actually do any kind of computation with this thing. You know, he's also well known for a few other things. Uh, and this is a picture of that uh, device. So people have actually built these things, although it was pretty much a uh, kind of mental exercise for Turing. Church's answer is perhaps less well known but it involved something uh, called the lambda calculus. And the lambda calculus is a very, very simple system where, uh, and if anyone has ever seen Lisp, this is a lot like kind of bare bones, stripped down Lisp. Uh, you only have a few operations that you can do. You can call functions, and that's about it. <laughs> uh, and so here are three different uh, kind of maneuvers you can do here. You can rename variables. The x's are the same as the y's there. Uh, you can apply, you can call a function, and you can kind of uh, cancel arguments. That's what I call. So that's what they call uh, eta conversion. So believe it or not, you can actually do stuff with lambda calculus. And so here's, here's an example of writing out some numbers with a lambda calculus. And the numbers are represented with sort of a different number of wrapped function calls for each number. And so if you're really interested, you can see uh, the last line there. That's the function which increments a number by one. 
So uh, you can work that out. You can see that like incrementing one will give you two. And what's perhaps really surprising is uh, both Church and Turing turn out to be totally equivalent that anything that you can compute, you can compute with lambda calculus, you can compute with a Turing machine. Uh, and so that's, I think, one of the really fascinating kind of surprising results. So that kind of leaves us with, uh, you know, where did functional programming come from? You know, it seems like it's this kind of recent thing to show up on the scene, but really uh, it's sort of been there from the beginning. It was one of the answers to the real fundamental question that kind of kicked off you know, what we think of today as uh, computation. And so here we are like 80 years later, and uh, for whatever reason, <clears throat> most programming languages have sort of adopted the Turing model rather than uh, Church's model. So that brings me to part two. How do you actually program with functions? So a function is, uh, if you're thinking from an object-oriented point of view, it's really just something that has one method named call. And what it does is it just sets up a correspondence between inputs and outputs, where each input is related to exactly one output. And so if you take a look at this, there's something about this. So uh, this is basically just a uh, you know, class which has a single method that kind of rewrites my name how they always read it off in school, uh, that looks really familiar to this thing, which is uh, an anonymous function which returns uh, a little structure that also contains a function. And so you can call it by sort of doubly dereferencing this thing. You can kind of look up the name of the function, and then you can call it. And, um, so this is where I get a little inconsistent. So in Ruby, you can use uh, square brackets to call things. Um, I could also have actually used the dot call method. And unfortunately, I'm a little bit inconsistent. Sometimes I use square brackets. Sometimes I say dot call. But those, those all mean the same thing. And uh, kind of when I, was, uh, when I was looking this over, it's interesting to think that it's really not all that different from even this. And uh, this you could imagine like a big hash and the dot, dot, dot on either side. You can imagine that if I covered every single case that you would call my function on, uh, how it, that wouldn't really be any different than uh, the previous two. So uh, what is an object then? It's a context in which to call a function. And so if you think about new, it's also just that, uh, that first wrapping level that we had before. It sort of sets up the context that you're going to call everything else within. So object structure code, uh, and they have a little bit of state and a little bit of behavior. And functions also structure code just a little bit differently. They kind of move the state around. There's no state in the function. It's all behavior. So part three uh, brings us to abstraction. <clears throat> So the first thing that becomes really, really important if you're doing any sizable functional programming is sort of how to take these small little building blocks and sort of blend them together into more complicated things. And sort of like uh, the first stop on that uh, railroad is uh, composing things. And so again, I'm using some square brackets here. So when you compose two functions, you take the output of the first one and you pass it as the input to the second one. And so you sort of thread that x through those two function calls. And so down here, there's a, an add five function and a double function. And then I compose them like that. <clears throat> but uh, you may or may not have noticed that uh, the way I wrote compose, I can only use that with arguments of a single, fun or of a single uh, value. So here, uh, there's just a single x that it takes. Uh, but that's that's actually turns out to be okay because we can use currying. What currying does is currying takes something which has multiple arguments and it turns it into something which takes them kind of one by one. And so this is my sort of quasi JavaScript there, I guess, uh, where the x y turns into something that takes 
an x and returns something that takes a y and then returns your final answer. Um, and I was sort of surprised to find out that this is built into Ruby. So you can just call dot curry on any proc and it automatically does this for you. So you can combine these two things together uh, to compose a whole bunch of functions. And so here I make sort of a pipeline, which I call the compose all. And so I sort of uh, pairwise compose a list of functions down. And then, uh, so down at the bottom here, I have my three functions, add, announce, and uh, double. And so then I sort of thread the value three through all of my functions and get my answer. So this kind of lets you do sort of a pipelining type thing. If you kind of think of this as sort of a, a fluent interface where you can say something dot something dot something, you can kind of think of a whole bunch of behaviors all stacked together in a chain and then you pass a value through them all and you get sort of the result of doing everything. Is that, is that clear to everybody? Or? <laughs> so I want to change gears just a little bit here and start talking about map because I think map is a really interesting place to start uh, with functional programming. Uh, it's one of these things where uh, it's, uh, it's really a pattern, you know, it's, I think it in fact matches up to something like the uh, visitor pattern, sort of. Uh, and map, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, just something that takes a proc and applies it to each value in an array. Uh, and so the, uh, the notation that I'm introducing down here, you'll have, to, you'll have to forgive me, but this is just a little bit of crazy moon language. Uh, but sort of the idea here is that map first takes a thing which goes from int to int, and then if you give it a list of ints, it will return a list of ints. Uh, and so then with currying, you can really think of the uh, parentheses sort of getting pushed over uh, and that what it's doing is mapping is really the idea of taking a function which operates on single values and sort of lifting it up into a function that operates on lists of values. And so you can see how the parentheses kind of associate over to the right. And so there's really two arguments, or there's really one argument. It's a function, and then it returns something which now goes from lists to lists. And so, uh, in general, uh, instead, of, uh, instead of just mapping, which is sort of uh, particular to lists, uh, there's this sort of uh, cousin of it called fmap. And fmap is the idea of really just mapping over anything that can possibly contain a value. And so, fmap lifts something uh, to values that are in a context. So if this, uh, and so I do just a little bit of kind of maneuvering here uh, because I wanted fmap to really be uh, a, uh, a method on proc rather than uh, on all the different classes that I want to attach it to. And so this is a, a little bit of, a, I think, what tender love would call freedom patching. So, um, so here now I can do, at the bottom here, I can do lambda and then attach fmap to that and then feed it in my array of three elements, make it my back. So this is really no different than I, what, what I had been doing before. I just kind of rearranged things a little bit uh, that I sort of wanted the, the fmap to live on procs rather than on arrays or something like that. And the reason for that is because I really want to be able to call it on like anything. So. So here's a little custom uh, user class that I made up. And the idea here is that it just has one property, which is a name. And so I could define fmap on my user class. Uh, I think I'm missing an n. All right, all right, no, it's just a one line. Okay, uh, so anyway, uh, <laughs> I can call fmap on my user class and it sort of does the right thing as long as I sort of told it you know, what the meat is inside of the class that it should operate on. So here, it kind of reaches inside and applies the function to uh, the name. So there, uh, I just split on white space on my name. So FMAP is, really, <coughs> FMAP is really, really versatile. We can kind of throw this idea around all over the place. Uh, so there could be like empty or not values, or trees, or hashes, or even 
other functions. And so uh, if you'll bear with me, there is a, a couple of variations on fmap, which I think uh, if you kind of squint at them, you'll see a lot of similarities. So the first one is array, which I've sort of already talked about a little too much. But uh, with array, it kind of does the thing that you expect. You know, it applies, applies the function to each thing in turn and returns the result. Um, and so kind of the little brain twisty way is you can imagine in Ruby that, you know, I had some API where I said, okay, never ever pass anything as a bare value. Always have it wrapped in at least an array. So you would always have to do, you couldn't just call something, you would always have to map it because it was always going to be wrapped in an array. Uh, so to make that at all convenient, you'd have to kind of define this plumbing. And so the fmap for array is simply just the uh, array with map called on it, and then you uh, use, that, use that proc for each element. And so down here at the bottom, here's, uh, here's a little example of that. And like I said, I'm not super consistent in all these slides, so this is a little stabby proc down at the bottom. So one, two goes to two, three. <clears throat> so the next thing up here is a hash. So this one, this one makes sense if you ignore the keys. And so what this does is I, I make a new hash, but I've applied the function to all the values in the hash, but otherwise left it the same. So down at the bottom, there's my same little stabby proc, and uh, A1, B2 goes to A2, B3. So pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, <clears throat> now here's the one that's probably a little brain twisting, but uh, how about mapping uh, over procs themselves? And so what this does is it takes a value and <clears throat> kind of threads it through these two procs. And so down at the bottom, you can see uh, x plus 1 and y times 2. And then I fed 2 through these two things. So we go to 4 and then get added uh, 1. So then we end up with 5. <clears throat> and so the, the kind of interesting thing to notice is that for procs, uh, fmap is exactly the same as composing them. So. Uh, Here's kind of the same thing reiterated, but I wrote it with lambdas this time, I guess. So if you fmap these two things together, then you get the same thing, and it's just compose. And so the way I like to think about this is that uh, anytime you have a function that returns something, you can sort of uh, apply something to the eventual return value of that thing, sort of like a box that is going to you know, uh, return its value. So FMAP is really similar, uh, even though we are using it on all kinds of different classes. Uh, there are some properties of it that are really the same, and uh, <clears throat> in fact, you could uh, you could see that if FMAP is sort of doing the thing that you expect, it always has to obey this these two uh, laws at the bottom. So uh, basically, that if you compose two maps, it would be the same as composing the functions and then mapping. Uh, and then ID basically leaves things unmodified. So the thing that I'm kind of hinting at here is uh, what's known as parametric polymorphism, uh, or the kind of cosmic zen-like way is that the more general you are, the more specific you are. Because if I'm not able to really say anything about sort of the individual uh, peculiarities about the things that I'm mapping over, I have to always treat them very, very much the same. And so that's why these rules will hold for it, because I'm never ever going to be able to do anything to the uh, x's if I don't really know what the x's are. Uh, so it's just this concept of mapping without really talking about what the things are that I'm mapping over. So part four, uh, evaluation. Uh, so laziness is a big deal in a uh, functional programming, or uh, because this is the way that you achieve a lot of modularity. And so here's a little example where uh, I have an expensive function that I want to use kind of in combination with my compute function. And so I call this, and maybe unexpectedly, I get uh, the expensive function has been triggered. And so why did I even have to do that? Because I never used it. 
And in fact, you know, it's, it's totally impossible that I would ever use that. Um, <clears throat> so I, I sort of think that eager evaluation uh, really kind of mixes concerns. It sort of uh, mixes the kind of definition or sort of the, the, the use of the code with uh, just the code itself. And we really often want to kind of decouple these two things, like uh, scopes in Rails, uh, method definitions, lambdas, factory girl, let blocks. These are all places where you sort of want to define something, but you don't want to use it necessarily, or, or maybe at all. Um, so uh, I have a little example for uh, when laziness really comes in importantly. Uh, so here's, a, here's doing a, uh, a map over a whole big list of, uh, okay, yeah, so range here is a large value. And uh, I'm mapping something over it, but then simply taking the first thing. And so this would take time that's proportional to how many things I did that over. But uh, what's really cool in Ruby is it lets you throw in this lazy word, and what that does is, uh, among other things, it makes this thing almost instantaneous. Uh, and so I actually kind of timed this one out, and the difference is pretty striking, that I never had to realize that big uh, range of values because it turns out I was never going to use it, and the only value I ever got was the first one, and so it's very quick to get it. And uh, although I didn't have a good kind of code example for it here, and this is a, a little bit more crazy moon language, but what's kind of cool about this is you can actually turn sorting into a, uh, <clears throat> into a linear time thing, which if you're, if you're familiar with kind of the big O, this is it's pretty weird. You know, I've dropped sort of the log n term right out of there, that it will just take me time that's proportional to the length of things, which would be sort of like uh, kind of the high water mark, just scanning through it once and picking out the biggest one. But in a really general way, it looks like I sort the whole thing and then take the first one, but actually it's a... Uh... So, <clears throat> uh, part five is sort of just uh, potpourri. Uh, there are a couple things that I think are pretty cool. Uh, the first one is property testing, and so if if there's nothing else about this, uh, property testing I think is really, really cool, and the time has come. <laughs> so uh, the idea here is if you sort of know the domain and range of your function, you could get, it, you could get your, the testing framework to just throw a whole ton of examples at it and try to find weird little edge cases. So this is an example as if I had written sort, and I'm using a library called RushCheck, and so the idea here is that uh, after I sort an array, the length has to be the same. Um, the minimum element has to be at the start, and the uh, maximum element has to be the last one. And so when I run this, it actually generates you know, 300 tests for me, uh, trying to find cases where that's not true. And so, I think this really, really complements imperative style kind of happy path tests because these things are as like evil as possible and they find really strange kind of edge cases and values that uh, you'd have never thought of. Um, <clears throat> so these are, I have a couple of rant, rant mode slides. Uh, so I, I've been asked like, what do I like about functional programming or what does functional programming do better? And in my mind, it's basically stuff that I wouldn't even try to tackle uh, without using functional programming. It's, uh, it just kind of helps me sort of reason through problems in a way that kind of doesn't get out of hand. Um, uh, static types, I think, are also pretty cool. So this is not something that's in Ruby, uh, but, and testing, testing is kind of half of the way there, but I think the, the thing that I want to impress here is that if you're familiar with static types in any of the languages uh, up there, uh, they're really not much like that any longer. That sort of a lot has happened in static typing 
in the last 40 years or so. Uh, and languages such as F-sharp or OCaml, Haskell, Scala, Rust, uh, all of these things use uh, type inferencing that really lends themselves to very expressive code. And so, <clears throat> so here are a couple, couple more Haskell type signatures, but what's kind of neat about these is uh, from the type signature alone, it really tells you a lot about what's going on. Uh, in particular, finding. So if you have a, you have a function that will return true or false for some value in this, uh, in this list, the only possible place that you can get a value of A is from that list. And so it either has to be doing something like always picking the first value or always picking the last value. There's sort of nowhere else that that value can come from, which I think is kind of cool. Um, so that sort of when you think about kind of reasonable, reasonable implementations of these things, they really narrow down uh, kind of what the implementation could possibly be. And uh, so that's, that's sort of the idea of that these are like machine checked comments. And then the very last slide, which I think is still sort of a uh, ways out there, but I think is kind of neat, uh, are the idea of dependent types. And this is where you're getting into actually encoding the sorts of things that you would think uh, tests would look for actually into the type system. And so this is an example from a language called Idris uh, of adding two arrays or adding two vectors pairwise. And so this would be a compile error if you try to add a, a three element vector to a four element <coughs> vector, like the compiler would be able to flag that as something that just shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed to compile. Um, so that's about all I have for that. So thanks a lot for listening. Um, there's a lot of good resources that I've sort of dug through over the years. And uh, some, of, some of my favorites are up here, but uh, if you have any other questions, uh, please ask. Thanks. Yeah, I can probably take some questions. Maybe. Yeah, let me yeah. turn the lights up and <clears throat> questions. <clears throat> yes. Do you do a lot of functional Ruby programming, or is this just kind of an experiment to see if it's possible? Or um, yeah, I think on, on stuff I write, I definitely try to write in that kind of style, especially with like uh, some of the testing. Have you read like the metaprogramming book? Uh, metaprogramming Ruby? Yeah. Do you see any like parallels kind of in that? Because they kind of do some. Yeah, um, kind of. Like <laughs> the, uh, the thing is, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's sort of just reorganizing sort of where you put your code. A lot of the metaprogramming techniques kind of seem to me like they start out with like, this would be an interesting way to call this thing and then sort of kind of go backwards to like engineer the uh, class to actually be called that way. Um, and I think there's sort of less of that in kind of a more functional style. I think you kind of attack things in a more straightforward way, um, which would come off, come off as either more or less DSL-y depending on kind of how you do it. So, is that? <laughs> I mean, I don't know what you're talking about up there, but my brain hurts right now. So. <laughs> yes. So, so for someone who doesn't know kind of or hasn't hasn't had a lot of previous exposure to to functional programming, um, are there particular either situations or 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 places where where it would make sense for kind of a, a newbie to begin exploring um, more specific cases and, and less abstract th uh, theoretical ideas? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a book that came out this summer that I really like. Um, it's in JavaScript, but uh, I think a lot of people will probably also know JavaScript. Um, like uh, Michael Fogus wrote Functional JavaScript which I think is just really excellent JavaScript book and an excellent functional programming book, kind of all in one. Like I think that's kind of like knocked JavaScript, the good parts, off of the top of the heap in my opinion. So, 
can I add something to oh, that yeah. one? Um, I don't, so I've actually been doing quite a lot of JavaScript lately, specifically in Backbone, which has underscore there. I mean, there's tons of libraries that yeah. do that sort of stuff, but underscore is a very, it provides a lot of functional type stuff. Yeah. And I think that's actually like the subtitle to the functional JavaScript. It's kind of like starts out with underscore and kind of adds a whole bunch of oh, stuff oh. to it. I need to get that book. Yeah, but it's good. It, I think it's interesting because uh, where you see a lot of <clears throat> kind of the, the rush to, to kind of move a lot of to the front end frameworks and to kind of push data down and then mutate it and kind of filter it, do things on the in the browser, the, the stuff that Ruby kind of gives you out of the box, I guess. Well, some of like the Errol stuff along with the functional stuff that you would maybe do on the server, in some cases, you're now, you're kind of doing less constraints on the server and pushing data sets down to the client where you kind of, depending on how the user selects sorting or filtering in the browser, you might do more of it there. Uh, that's kind of what I've seen. Yeah, and I think like um, it's, it's a little bit in both in like Angular. That's kind of the only one that I'm somewhat familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's there's some pretty cool libraries out there in JavaScript with like um, I think like Bacon JS and like React JS, mm -hmm. like that are doing some pretty cool stuff with kind of uh, reactive programming. Which I think like uh, it's kind of it's kind of an Angular sort of the the instant you update some input box, it sort of feeds that back into your kind of model. And there's some pretty cool stuff kind of just hooking these inputs up to outputs and sort of just processing everything as like a big pipeline. Yes, so. yeah, and that, I don't know if anyone's used, from what I've seen, I've used the React JS, but I did do React, uh, the C Sharp, or the Reactive mm -hmm. Extensions for yeah. .NET, yeah. and I think they're all kind of related, um, a lot of the reactive frameworks. They definitely, like, doing like functional responses, or functional lambdas, on events is very, and then chaining them is very interesting. Yeah. Because you're saying, you're basically saying like, I wanna filter only these events, or I wanna take action, like pipe all the events to me, and then right. I'll decide in my handler. Drop these ones, right. like double this. Exactly, know, kind of exactly. So yeah, I've been meaning to look into, actually some people are building new JavaScript app frameworks on top of React yeah. JS. Yeah, so I think, I think there's a lot of cool stuff kind of happening in that area. It seems like there's just a lot of experimentation. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, is there anything in JavaScript that you feel isn't, you know, like, I don't know, as, as easy to do as you might do in, in Haskell or in Lisp or something like that? I, I guess for me, like, JavaScript was the first, like, taste of functional programming, and it was cool because I finally, like, was like, oh, well, I kind of get this. Like, this is cool. Yeah. Cool things. But I've always kind of wondered if, like, there's some part of it that I'm missing that in this functional first language that I'm, that I'm not getting. Yeah, I think I think probably the biggest thing is JavaScript is is uh, is mutable and not typed. <laughs> so I think I think all the things that kind of come along with that, you sort of need a lot more in your testing framework to kind of support. You know, just a, there's a lot of kind of silly errors in JavaScript that are sort of easy to do if you're not careful. I so think. Do you see like TypeScript or Dart? Or yeah, or like, like I, I, I was, I, I thought TypeScript was pretty cool. Like that's, that's sort of a Microsoft thing. Like I was working for a while on the like TypeScript Rails plugin, but it's, it seems pretty cool because it's, it's sort of a similar idea to CoffeeScript where it, you know it's compiled to <coughs> JavaScript. But the, the difference with CoffeeScript is, uh, if you just took a JavaScript file, it's already valid TypeScript. You know, it's just then you can kind of go in there and say, okay, I really want this to be a string and this has to be a number, and then to like flag all the places where you sort of violate that. You know, in kind of like a, in sort of a hands off y kind of way, everything is just kind of a warning, you know, but still seems like it helps quite a bit. Cool. Well, thank you very much. All righty. Thank you.